So welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us today uh, to this meeting. My name is Jorge Meneses. I am the current president of the ERI San Diego chapter. I'm also a member of the ERI uh, board of directors. So I think welcome again to everybody to this, uh, to this meeting. So I think that you already know the purpose of this meeting is to have a CGS and also Professor um, Rockwell present and discuss the new revisions to the Alquist Priolo uh, fall zone maps here in San Diego. So this is basically to provide a background information so we can uh, provide uh, the feedback that CGS is requesting for from the uh, engineering community. Okay, so what we are going to have uh, as a program is uh, we are going to have first Professor Tom Rockwell to give us a presentation for about 25 minutes. And then we are going to have the presentation from the CGS, Tim Dawson and Mike DeFrisco. Uh, and then we are going to have a session uh, time for questions and answers. What we are going to do is that we are going to use the raise hand option. And you can see the reaction icon at the bottom right hand side of the screen in the menu bar. So click on the reaction button and then click on the raise hand button. Okay. So this is a way how you are, we are going to proceed at the end of the presentations. After the presentation, the three presentations back to back, we are going to uh, have the questions and answer session. So as you raise your hand, I will ask people to introduce them, themselves, just name and affiliation. And then So <clears throat> upcoming events that the chapter is organizing. So this April 20th, uh, we, are, we are going to have our traditional our annual joint meeting with SEOS, the Structural Engineers Association of San Diego. And the topic will be about the 2021 Oshford and City of San Diego seismic instrumentation programs. They will be at noon. Um, and we are going to have this for about maybe one hour and 30 minutes. Then uh, we have already scheduled our third uh, Kenji Shihara colloquium series on earthquake engineering. And this year, the, the topic will be about base isolation, damping systems, and soil structure interaction. So we are uh, organizing this in three webinars in three different dates, in, in three Fridays, uh, next month, month, May 14th, May 21st, and May 28th. Uh, also, this will be at noon. So the, the three of them on Fridays, the 14th, 21st, and 28th of May. And then finally, we are going to have, a, well, finally, before the, the, the summer, we are going to have a Professor Kevin Franke from BYU, who will give us a webinar about a new probabilistic common origin approach to assess a level ground liquefaction. Uh, for further information, you can check our website and you will have the, the information about, more information about these meetings, the presentations, a description of the presenters, et cetera, et cetera. Also, maybe you have already uh, heard that the a few minutes ago, the governor of the state of California has announced that most likely the state will be fully reopened on June 15th, depending upon that uh, if the number of cases continue decreasing and the number of vaccinations continue increasing. So hopefully this is the case and also look like from today, the San Diego County is moving to the orange tier. We are in coordination with the County of San Diego, the Chief of Resilience, to see also how we are going to proceed with our um, in-person events, uh, probably um, uh, from the summer. Okay, so let's start our program today. And we are going to have first 
Professor uh, Tom Rockwell that will give us uh, uh, his presentation. Um, before that, uh, I, I know that all of you know Professor Tom Rockwell, but let me give you uh, a reminder about his, uh, uh, just a, a short bio. Professor Rockwell is a nationally and internationally renowned paleoseismologist and structural geologist who has published over 120 articles in major international journals co-authored a number of book chapters, published 40 papers in conference proceedings and guidebooks, and co-authored over 300 papers presented at professional meetings. Having served as geology group leader of the Southern California Earthquake Center for many years, he's an expert on the tectonics and earthquake hazards of Southern California and Baja California has conducted extensive trenching programs to date earthquakes on faults in the Western US, South and Central America, the Middle East and Asia, and routinely uses soil stratigraphy and geomorphology combined with various radiometric dating techniques to assess rates of fault activity, determine recency of faulting, and date uh, past earthquakes. Current projects include characterization of fault systems behavior by understanding patterns of past recurrence of large earthquakes on faults in Southern California, Northern Mexico, Panama, Argentina, Portugal, Spain, Turkey, India, and Israel. Uh, <clears throat> I think that this is enough. We have much more information about him. But I think it's uh, time for Professor Rockwell to uh, start his presentation. <clears throat> okay. You're on mute, Tom. Is that better? I thought it was unmuted. Can everyone see my screen? <clears throat> yes. Paleoseismic history and slip rate of the Rose Canyon Fault in San Diego. Does not seem, okay. So I'm gonna give a summary of what we know at this point based on a lot of recent information. Some of this will be old news to you, some will be new. Uh, perhaps the, the newest stuff that you probably haven't seen relates to the slip rate on the Rose Canyon Fault. But first, I'm going to talk about the earthquake history of the Rose Canyon Fault as we understand it now. And then move on to the, our current understanding of the slip rate, uh, including new campaign GPS data. Uh, and I'll briefly touch on um, our estimates of likely rupture displacements for major Rose Canyon Fault earthquakes and uh, our best estimate of the magnitude of the largest earthquakes. And uh, this information went into uh, the recent earthquake scenario for San Diego that many of you were involved with. So just as a background, uh, the Rose Canyon Fault is part of the plate boundary system of active strikes at faults in Southern California. Most of this train is off to the east along the San Andreas, the San Jacinto, and the Elsinore Faults, but about 10% uh, of that strain, about 50 millimeters a year, so 10% of 50, uh, is coming up the coast and is in the offshore. And part of that is distributed along the Rose Canyon Fault. <clears throat> uh, the Rose Canyon Fault in San Diego is well recognized, it's well defined on shore, uh, both from its geomorphology in general, but also from numerous recent studies that have delineated where many and most or many of the active traces are. Uh, the fault steps on shore from the south, from the Descanso Fault, uh, producing downdropping in San Diego Bay. Um, and there's also uh, the effects of the La Nacion and then slip coming up from the San Miguel Valacizos Fault System in Baja, California. Uh, the slip is distributed on multiple strands through San Diego Bay. Uh, um, so displacement down in this area is difficult, but I think along the central part of the onshore fault, we have a pretty good idea what to expect in terms of displacement. This is a DEM <clears throat> showing Northern Baja California and Southern California. So of course, this is San Diego Bay. San Diego is this whole area. 
and Point Loma is right here. And I want to point out, everyone knows or probably knows about the Aga Blanca fault that transfers about four millimeters of, of a year of slip into the offshore. There's also the Salsa Puedes fault, which is about one and a half millimeters a year. And then there's the San Miguel Valesilos fault system here, <clears throat> which um, is geomorphically very expressed in the topography. You can see the uplift of parts of Tijuana here. And that feed slipped directly into San Diego as well. And yet this fault is poorly studied in terms of its recent rupture history. We know down to the south, we had a rupture in 1956 a magnitude 6.8 that produced over meter displacement. And there's been seven earthquakes over magnitude six on the system historically. So it's certainly a seismically active fault system. Now, I think one thing I found very interesting is that um, a very early sketch in 1876 basically drew the fault and I'm really impressed by the early artists because um, they, and I'm gonna show you a, a blow up of this, but uh, on this lower panel, but they were able to show um, uh, some liniments like this one right here with deflected channels. This, uh, this artist was very accurate in his depiction. You have these rills coming up and they deflect to the right. These come up and deflect to the right. And there's a scarp down here. Well, it turns out these were um, confirmed as active faults in 1985 when the police administration and tactical center excavation uh, was dug out and they exposed these faults in the sidewall. So this is the approximate location of the sidewall of that excavation. And this fault right here cut the topsoil, offset the A horizon, the E horizon, the argillic horizon, was very obviously an active mm -hmm. fault. And then subsequent work in the downtown area by uh, URS uh, showed that uh, uh, there was fissuring of soil material down into the fault zone. They collected charcoal from this and showed that uh, the most recent earthquake was um, between 1420 and 1650 or younger. So that was the age on the charcoal. The rupture was certainly younger than that. Uh, that was followed by work we did in Rose Creek. Uh, our first trench across the fault that showed unequivocal evidence of, uh, of repeated Holocene activity. Uh, this is one of the exposures. And here you have the, the B horizon and a little remnant of the E and the A uh, faulted over more A horizon material. This is the stuff you grow your roses in. This is a very young active fault. And that was a very young surface rupture. And from that, we identified uh, some past earthquakes uh, where we had upward terminations capped by soil units, and we identified up to three uh, paleo earthquakes, but the entire section was deposited between uh, about nine and 7,000 years ago, so we only had a short interval of time. After that, oh, here's a detail of that, so these stars represent uh, where we identified the presence of earthquake horizons. Uh, and from that, we had interpreted these three earlier uh, Holocene earthquakes, We'd inferred at least two more, but we didn't really have any constraint on this because deposition at the site had ended about 7,000 years ago. Uh, and then it was developed with a soil over it. So, and then we also knew we had a very recent earthquake. So one thing that was very clear is that we needed uh, a site with young Holocene sedimentation that we could derive a younger earthquake history from. Uh, also in La Jolla, uh, this was part of Molly Murbach's master's thesis. Uh, we excavated a trench uh, only a couple blocks from the beach and had uh, Native American uh, midden deposits fissured down deep into the fault zone and collecting samples from down here we again dated a late Holocene earthquake that was uh, 1650 plus or minus or younger. So again uh, basically if we look we've had samples from La Jolla, Rose Creek, I'll show you Old Town momentarily and then downtown all showing that we had an earthquake in the last few hundred years. And it well demonstrates that the Rose Canyon Fault ruptured at least the entire onshore portion in the last few hundred years. So uh, one site we'd always been intrigued by and didn't have access to until recently was at the Old Town Golf Course. And we liked this site because our estimate of where that we knew uh, the fault was precisely right here because of excavations uh, by Leighton and Associates that showed it going through the old Mormon Battalion Center. It had liniments going up through here and up through Morena District, and we really wanted access to the site. So we finally were granted access. 
And this is an effort that uh, uh, was done by a number of us, Monty Murbach, Diane Murbach, um, many others that, uh, in fact, it was Diane who I think is instrumental in getting us through the city because we got the permit in and it only took us a year. I'm told that's fast. Uh, for me, getting a permit in a year is pretty slow. But nevertheless, we were able to do a series of, of um, CPTs across both the northwest and southeast edges of the golf course and identify where the fault was. And our first trench we chose, um, this was funded by uh, SoCal Edison. Uh, they're interested in earthquake history of the West King Fault. And our first excavation, we started up here uh, near CPT-6 and started moving to the southwest. And we did cross a secondary fault. Um, but we encountered a historical uh, Spanish or Mexican era uh, foundation wall and tile floor. And we had archaeologists on site and that immediately shut down uh, the trench. So from that, uh, we had to move to the south uh, eastern corner and uh, we did that with USGS funding. So this was the trench site along the southeastern margin of the golf course. The golf course is in the upper right here off to the right. And we were excavating this trench right down the margins at the base of slope. So here we have our group installing shores. And we exposed a section that included uh, surprisingly historical deposits, all this light colored stuff is historical. Uh, this dark uh, soil here at the surface was the, the modern ground surface when the Spanish settled the area. It had uh, glass pottery, iron fragments and fire pits, barbecue pits with cow bones in it. So we're very clearly historical. And uh, we uh, photo mosaic it, logged it in detail. I'll show you examples of a, a few of the events that we had interpreted. Uh, one that was surprising is that the actual historical deposits themselves turned out to be faulted. <clears throat> so uh, we use the same kind of um, analysis we use in research for determining the timing of past earthquakes. Uh, for instance, we had a very distinctive silty unit here that was faulted up to here, and then it was capped uh, by this soil, which was unfaulted, as well as other overlying stratigraphy. This was associated with our uh, fifth event back. And I want to point out that uh, this silty unit here steps up to the right, whereas these silt packages step down to the right. So this unit here is much thinner than to the right of the fall. Uh, this implies substantial strike slip. Uh, there was clear evidence of strike slip at several of these uh, fault strands through the exposure. Uh, I'll show you this again in a minute, but this is the contact, the top of the historical horizon, the living horizon in the late 1700s. And this is all uh, historical alluvium that came down naturally and buried that surface and it's faulted. And we'll talk about that in a in a minute. So here's some other evidence. Uh, we have, for instance, this uh, weak A horizon soil faulted and then capped by fine silt layers. We had more faulting up to this level. Again, uh, a little fissure here and it capped by unfaulted material. This is the type of evidence that we use to um, determine where the ground surface was at the time of an earthquake. And this is all published in uh, Drake Singleton's paper, we published in 2018, and it's available, I believe that's in BSSA, but that's available to anyone who asked me for it. So we collected 43 radiocarbon, or a lot more than that, actually carbon samples. We dated 43 of them to develop our chronologic model for the site. And based on that, we develop uh, probability density functions, PDFs, of the event ages. We identified evidence for six earthquakes, four of which we interpret to be large. Now, uh, this is what San Diego looked like in 1874. And you might notice these uh, rills here on the hill slope. Um, some of these rills appear to coincide with the location of fault strands in the trench. And uh, we know that uh, at least uh, this fault ruptured this historical horizon. Oops. So, the central fault ruptured the historical living surface. Uh, the only earthquake we have historically that could have done that is the May 27th, 1862 earthquake. And that was known as the Day of Terror in San Diego and had an estimated magnitude of six. And typically we don't think of magnitude six earthquakes as rupturing to the surface. And this is the only place in San Diego where we encountered evidence that 1862 did rupture to the 
the surface, but it was probably on the Spanish Fight Fault or right at the corner of the Spanish Fight where it intersects the main Rose Canyon Fault. And uh, this is an isoseism from that earthquake. And this account up here was published in the Los Angeles Star. Um, and it says basically, on the 27th of May to the June 14th, we have been favored with a remarkable succession of temblores. The main shocks of May 27th, two in quick succession at uh, 12, lasted some 10 seconds. That's consistent with the magnitude six. During the same afternoon, seven other shocks were counted. May, we may well term this the day of terror for the people rushed from their houses to the streets and public square and numbers remaining long in the attitude of prayer. Okay, so uh, 1862 is the day of terror in San Diego. Uh, I think we found uh, evidence of surface rupture for that in Old Town, which was unexpected. So this is our current understanding of uh, the earthquake history in San Diego. We have no data for the central part of the Holocene, but the early Holocene, we had three events between, uh, I think nine and a half and seven, some, seven and a half thousand years ago. And then uh, the late Holocene record, we have six events, four of which we interpret to be large. And that yields uh, a, a recurrence interval for large earthquakes of about 700 years. And it's shorter than that if we include the moderate earthquakes like 1862. And most of those size earthquakes are probably obliterated. The evidence for them would likely be obliterated by the larger events. So uh, they may be uh, more fre frequent than we've seen. We saw, saw one or evidence for one around 700 AD and then 1862. Uh, but those are the ones that worry me because we may not have ev evidence for these magnitude six size earthquakes. Okay, so how fast is this fault moving in the long term? In other words, what's the strain accumulation rate? Well, the first study we did back in 1990 and 91 was at Rose Creek where we identified um, a scarp in a low terrace to Rose Creek. And the scarp was running right on the edge here. So um, as we're gonna see, uh, we lost part of the evidence for this, but uh, we went, this is now the uh, Tri-Cities SDG&E um, parking lot, and that's where we did most of this work. We also had a pressure ridge here, a very nice little sag pond here. This is a photo in the upper left. Uh, the sag pond is under this structure here. Uh, this would be the pressure ridge, and these are our excavations in the parking lot, parking lot of the SDG&E facility. And our initial trench was across the fault underneath this loader, but when we're looking for slip, uh, we trench parallel to the fault to try to identify uh, channels or other linear features that we can use to identify and actually measure displacement. And uh, what we found in the fault parallel trenches was a tiny little gravel fill channel. This is what it looked like. It was about a half meter wide, or maybe only 30 or 40 centimeters, but it was unique in the section. So we had to decide uh, what to do here. And we decided we'd go ahead and see if we could excavate it across the fault. And it took five of us seven weeks of hand excavation to carefully trace this across the fault. Um, each of these uh, uh, markers indicates the location. We crossed a, a fault strand here, and there was another major strand here. We should have a marker here, but we ran out of them. So the gravel was preserved here in this block over here. And then at this last one in the upper right, this is where the section that contained the channel was cut out by grading in 1960. So after all that work, we surveyed all of these uh, locations in, the locations of the channels and other stratigraphic units. And we ended up with a map like this. We could demonstrate a minimum of 8.7 meters of lateral slip in the last 8,000 years. And all after all that work, we got a minimum slip rate of 1.1 millimeters a year on just one strand of the fault. And in this area, we know there are multiple strands. So the work we did was right here, um, but based on both uh, the channel was cut out, we don't know how much uh, was actually offset. And the fact we had multiple strands up there, 1.1 uh, millimeters a year was our minimum slip rate. And based on that, we estimated that, well, uh, it's probably on the order of one and a half plus or minus a half. So we gave a range of one to two millimeters a year which in hindsight underestimated the actual rate on the Rose Canyon. Uh, one thing we had noticed uh, in this, and we published this again in that uh, 1995 paper, but uh, this 
section of the fault had beautiful offset channels that ranged from about 100 to 250 meters of lateral offset. And uh, later work showed that these were incised into alluvium that buried the last interglacial marine terrace, the 5E terrace at 120,000 years. So uh, I published in 2010 that probably the slip rate was more like 2 millimeters a year. And our old town site here, we did the 3D or the uh, 2D trenching at the golf course. This is a 1928 photo, but channels again were deflected on the order of uh, 250 meters or so. So uh, that seemed like a reasonable rate. Uh, and then Drake Singleton, my uh, PhD student, jointly with Jillian Maloney at SDSU, um, one of the first projects when he came on board back in around 2015 or so uh, is we started him on a campaign to remeasure some campaign GPS stations, a network that uh, Duncan Agnew at Scripps put in uh, back in the late 90s. And I knew about this at the time because Duncan told me back in the early 2000s during the resurvey that, you know, Tom, it looks like the rate may be higher than you think. And I said, really? Well, that's really interesting. Why don't we resurvey it? And he uh, never got back to that. So when Drake came along, uh, we put Drake on that. And uh, what's really cool about these sites is that you have multiple stations very close together and uh, GPS is highly accurate over short baselines. So we use this to test uh, monument stability. So having numerous monument, monument sustained submillimeter stability, uh, we can demonstrate that these are stable over the last 20 years. And so here's one of the time series uh, or the, the monument uh, showing that they're, um, they've been very stable. Okay, so um, combine, we combine the campaign and continuous GPS network data. Uh, they were processed jointly uh, with uh, these software packages, Gamut and Glo uh, Globex. And we used a buried dislocation. I should say Drake used the buried dislocation model. I didn't do this elastic half-space modeling. Uh, Drake used this model to constrain the amount of slip occurring in the fault at depth, which is uh, below the brittle ductal transition. So we're looking at the strain accumulation rate across the Rose Canyon Fault. And uh, you get this typical arctan function uh, which is seen in GPS data when you uh, look at the far field strain accumulation. And my screen stopped advancing. Well, that's not good. There we go, whoops. Okay, so uh, following the methods of Dixon uh, 2002 who worked on the uh, GPS network of Northern Baja, California, the model fit with a, was evaluated with chi-squared uh, chi uh, statistics. And we take the, the best model as the one with the lowest chi-squared value. And so these are the, we use three transects, one to the north, one in the middle, one to the south. And one in the middle had the least projection is probably uh, the most accurate, but it was also yielded the highest rate. So, um, and some of the lowest chi-squared statistics. So the weighted mean for all three of these transects uh, is two and a half, 2.4 millimeters, plus or minus a half millimeter a year. And we take that right now as the preferred rate for the Rose Canyon Fault. Uh, this is in a paper that's uh, ready to submit. Once a paper that we're basing some of the structural modeling on is published and that's been through review, we're waiting for its uh, acceptance. And then we'll be submitting this. And once it's uh, been through review, I'm be happy to share it with anyone who is interested. So the Rose Canyon slip rate appears to be higher than we originally thought, uh, at about two and a half millimeters a year. And uh, it's consistent with the shorter recurrence interval. So we're getting more frequent earthquakes and a higher slip rate than we thought 20 years ago. So here's our composite history again. And if you take that uh, two to three millimeters, uh, an average recurrence interval of 700 years, uh, this suggests average displacements of about one and a half to two meters uh, per event. And we use the two meters in the planning scenario uh, from, uh, that was just presented last year. And we also uh, want to try to get an estimate of displacement along the rupture length. And we use the Biazzi et al. 2011 model where they, they collected dozens of uh, ruptures from the well-documented ruptures from around the world and developed a model of average displacement from end to end on the fault. So this is, this is their data. This is our model fit to it. And then we, we scaled it, assuming the rupture went from 
the step over near Oceanside down to San Diego Bay. And then we can estimate displacement at different points along the fault. And this again is in the uh, um, earthquake plan scenario for San Diego that was presented last year uh, at the NEC meeting. Okay, so in summary, new data suggests that the average recurrence in a large earthquake is about 700 years, uh, although it's shorter when considering 1862 type smaller events. And magnitude six being a smaller event, it was still uh, do or potentially do considerable damage. And at two to three millimeters a year, this suggests events have displacements in the range of one and a half to two meters, or for you engineers who don't do metric, it's five to six, six and a half feet per earthquake. Uh, uh, that's enough to disturb any building if it goes through it. Assuming complete rupture from ocean side to the international border, um, that's about 65 kilometers. Uh, we get a, a fairly about a, well, a rupture area of about 780 square kilometers. And it's smaller than that, only about a little over 500 square kilometers if the rupture terminates in San Diego Bay. And we've used that uh, to calculate the expected moment in such earthquakes. And from that, derive the expected uh, moment magnitude. And uh, from that, we use the magnitude 6.9 earthquake scenario. Uh, but again, there appear to be more frequent small earthquakes in the magnitude 6 range. That could be locally destructive, but uh, will tend to release very little of the accumulated strain. So most of that strain energy is going to be released in these larger earthquakes. Okay, that's it for my part. I'm going to now turn it over to Tim Dawson. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Rockwell. So <clears throat> again, uh, questions and answers will be at the end of the three presentations. You have to raise your hand to do that. You have to go to the reaction icon at the bottom right hand side of the screen in the menu bar, and then click on the reaction button, and then click on the raise hand button. Okay. So now we are going to have the presentations by Tim Dawson and Michael DeFrisco. So Tim Dawson is a specialist in earthquake a geology and characterization of fault displacement hazards. He studied numerous uh, faults throughout California, as well as Alaska, Turkey, Panama, and Myanmar. And he has participated in several post-earthquake earthquake investigations, including the 1999 earthquake in Turkey, the 1999 Hector Mine uh, earthquake, the 2002 Denali, Alaska earthquake, 2014 South Napa earthquake, and the 2019 Ridgecrest earthquake sequence. He joined CGS in 2007 and currently manages the fault zonation program at CGS, which is responsible for mapping active faults and establishing regulatory zones of required investigation surrounding active faults in California. His current <clears throat> duties include supervising fault evaluations throughout the state, integrating new fault mapping uh, technologies, and improved uh, for, uh, workflows into CGS fault evaluations, and ensuring state-of-the-art training and professional development for staff working in the fault zonation program. Uh, he got a master's degree in geology from the San Diego State University and a bachelor of science degree in geological sciences from the University of Oregon. He's both a licensed uh, professional geologist and certified engineering geologist in the state of California. Prior to joining CGS, he worked as a research geologist at the USGS, as well as a consulting geologist on numerous uh, seismic hazard uh, assessments for projects around the world. Then about Michael De Frisco, he's an engineering geologist with the California Geological Survey Seismic Hazard Program, where he performs uh, fault evaluations under the AP Earthquake Fault Zoning Act and provides review of engineering geology and seismology reports for proposed construction at public schools and hospitals 
throughout the state of California. He holds a bachelor degree in geology from California State University, Northridge, and is a licensed professional geologist and certified engineering geologist. Michael uh, joined uh, CGS in 2016 after working for more than 20 years as a consulting geologist in the private sector where he performed subsurface investigations as part of engineering geologic assessments of proposed developments in Southern California. He was also a technical project manager for major projects throughout Southern California, Edison's 50,000 square mile territory where he managed engineering geologic investigations and evaluated uh, seismic hazards. So now, uh, Tim, um, if you can start. Okay, thank you, Jorge. Um, before we get started, let me, because I'm trying to share my screen here, um, just like to thank the EERI team for inviting us to give this presentation and thank everyone for joining us this afternoon. Um, so today, I got a we just celebrated the 50th anniversary of the 1971 San Fernando earthquake. And so today I'm gonna to talk about that earthquake and the subsequent legislation that was developed out of that earthquake called the Alquist Frail of Fault Zoning Act and the legacy of that in California. So that's sort of why the name of the title of the talk is Landscapes Legislation, the Legacy of the 1971 San Fernando Earthquake in California. Okay. okay, so next slide here is just some basic parameters of the 1971 earthquake. The, the main takeaways from this is that it was, it was a moderate sized earthquake. It was magnitude 6.6 .6, um, moment magnitude, about 10 kilometers depth. Um, and it resulted in about 64 deaths, about half of a billion dollars in damage. Um, and it, it was impactful in that it occurred in a pretty populated area within the Los Angeles Basin, San Fernando Valley. Um, so it's, it's really the kind of the first earthquake in an urban area that produced surface fault rupture, as you can see here in this next slide. About 20 kilometers, that's about 12 miles of surface rupture extending through the San Fernando Valley and then off to, the, off to the east here along the Sierra Madre fault zone. Um, it had about sub-equal amounts of reverse and left lateral displacement along its length. And then the maximum displacement was about two meters. So that's about six and a half feet. And oops, I am scrolling ahead too fast here. Anyway, here's some vintage photos from that earthquake um, taken by one of the CGS then called the California Division Mines and Geology. Um, by James Kelly. And here on the on the very left is the scarp at Lopez Canyon with about maybe three feet of vertical displacement. In the middle here is where it crosses a road near Lopez Canyon. Again, you can see how the fault uplifted the road and maybe you can detect a little bit of lateral movement, although in this view, it's a little bit hard to see. I'll show better examples of that later. And then finally, whoops. On, on the far right here is where the fault crosses through this person's front yard and nicks the side of their house. And this is in the, you know, San Fernando Valley was developed at that time, a lot of housing in that area. Here's um, another couple of photos of then and now. And these are photos, this was taken shortly after the earthquake in February of 1971. You can see the fault outlined by these red arrows um, very slight scarp. You can see maybe even this hedge has been uplifted over here. Note this tree for scale. And then here's a photo on the right oops, of, of what it looks like today. You can still see the same trees here, but you can't really see much evidence of the fault in this view. However, if you go back looking the other way, um, some, of, some of the evidence of this earthquake is still here preserved today. And here's another photo by our, one of our geologists, Brian Olson, showing that the street, which was originally straight, presumably, is still re still retains a left lateral sense of deflection along this curve. The curve, of course, has been replaced. Um, 
but they couldn't straighten out the street. And then here on the right here, whoops, next one, um, is the scarp as it goes through a McDonald's parking lot on Fair Oaks Boulevard and Silmar. Um, instead of flattening it out, they just kind of decided it'd be part of the landscaping of this parking lot. So I'm going to focus mostly on the lessons learned from surface fault rupture during this earthquake. And one of the things that's been documented in various publications that came out after the earthquake was that damage in the fault zone was very concentrated. Um, it was, you know, within or close proximity to the fault zone, 80% of homes were damaged, you know, sort of a moderate way versus 30% outside the fault zone. But severe damage was definitely concentrated within that area as well. Um, so the two takeaways from this was that damage was localized near the fault zones. And then one conclusion in this report by Yerkes that came out in 1973 is that the fault location could have been identified had studies been conducted prior to the earthquake. So this, this really led to the thought that well, they could legislate this, this hazard of surface fault rupture. Um, and, you know, this, this, is, this concept is captured by this, this quote by Jake Johns, who is a professor at um, Stanford University, who said that, yeah, you could, you could legislate this hazard. It's easy to deal with. You can map the faults ahead of time, and then you can prohibit building on them. Um, and so this concept was taken into into account by Senator Alfred Alquist and Assemblyman Paul Priolo in the Senate Bill 520. And it was originally called the Alquist Priolo um, Geologic Hazard Zones Act. It was originally intended to address other ground deformation hazards, but at the time they decided that surface fault rupture was the easiest one to address through legislation. And so that's the genesis of the AP Earthquake Fault Zoning Act. And then since 1971, you know, we've had various examples of the impacts of surface fault ruptures on structures um, around the world. And so we've had, you know, the 1992 Landers earthquake here in the upper left, um, 1999 Isma Turkey. Here's a photo that I took of this formerly uh, three story building, now one story that crosses the fault here. Um, so some combination of surface fault rupture and ground motion probably destabilized the soft first story. Um, 1999 Chichi earthquake, you can see the scarp clearly goes through this building. This building, you know, roof line was originally flat as well as all these floors did not collapse. It was well constructed, but still sustained extreme damage. And then this house in uh, New Zealand during the 19 or the 2016 earthquake. And so the basic intent of the AP Act is to prohibit building structures for human occupancy across the traces of active faults, and then you avoid the hazard of surface fault rupture. Um, we've also learned that mitigation by avoidance is, is, is something that works, I think, and is relatively easy to implement. And here on the left is a photo taken by Lloyd Clough that he gave to me. Just showing again, it's the 1999 earthquake in Izmir, Turkey, showing the location of the fault rupture. And you can see that, you know, just a few meters away from where the fault broke to the surface, these structures did relatively well. Um, you know, and this is this is in Turkey where not all structures are well built for earthquake hazards, and they actually performed without much damage, at least visible damage on the outside, and didn't collapse. More locally, uh, especially for those of you in San Diego, is this building or a development um, on Broadway Street between 14th and 15th Streets. Um, you know, they, this was in the downtown special studies area that the city has within what, and within our AP zones. Um, and it clearly looks like, you know, they, they did these studies. I'll talk a little bit more about this later in the, in the talk about where the trenches were. They did some geologic studies, established where the active trace of this fault was downtown, and then developed this fault setback. And eventually, it looks like they turned it into a nice little courtyard and green space in between these, these um, what look like mixed-use residential commercial buildings. 
Um, so there's a lot of nuts and bolts to the AP Act. I'm going to focus on sort of the ones that matter the most. Um, and there's four entities that sort of are involved with or, uh, the administration of the AP Act. Um, the State Mining and Geology Board serves mostly as an administrative um, role within all this. They, they talk about the policies and criteria. Um, this is all outlined in their documents as well as our special publication 42. Um, also here is the state geologist that being the California Geologic Survey and our responsibilities are to evaluate the faults for evidence of activity. And if we find those faults to be active, we designate these regulatory earthquake fault zones of required investigation. And then closer to each development within one of these AP zones, the cities and counties, otherwise known as lead agencies, they're responsible for updating their general plans to make sure that investigations are occur within our zones. Um, they require the site investigations to happen prior to development, and then they review those site investigations and eventually approve the projects. And then finally, the property owners and developers are responsible for determining if the hazard's present through geologic studies and then rec making recommendations to avoid the hazard if one's identified. And a, there's also a disclosure requirement within the AP Act that is prior to the sale of a property, the, the owner is supposed to notify the seller or the buyer that they're within one of these earthquake fault zones. So a lot of Times we get these questions like what constitutes a project under the AP Act. This is out of the AP Act itself and the regulations. Um, basically, it's any place where there's going to be development of um, structures for human occupancy. Um, the language is a little bit convoluted at times. So if it if it's a building that's going to be occupied by humans, that can include even parking structures. Um, you know. Sometimes it includes certain types of small structures. Um, it falls under the AP Act. And then under the regulations, it's a sort of a 2,000 person hour per year occupancy that's, that meets that criteria. Um, there's also some projects that are exempted by the AP Act that includes single family wood frame or steel frame dwellings where reports have already been approved. And then also single family homes or um, dwellings that don't exceed two stories and within developments that are, are less than four dwellings in number. And so, and there's also an exemption for you know, a grandfather clause for structures in existence prior to 1975 or, and then also includes um, sort of a remodeling criteria that if, the building's remodeled has to be less than 50% of the value of the structure. So a lot of times people wonder like what constitutes an active fault? So an active fault under the definitions is a Holstein active fault that's activity within the last 11,700 years or so. Um, conceptually what this means is that if someone digs say a trench across a fault, you can encounter different classes of faults. The first is this Holstein active fault criteria. These are faults that cut Holocene deposits, whether they're early Holocene deposits or late Holocene deposits. These are the faults that are regulated by the AP Act and you'd have to set back from if these were crossing a project. Um, we also have these pre-Holocene faults. These are faults that clearly do not cut Holocene deposits, therefore they're not regulated by the AP Act. Um, you can see these, these faults labeled here as number twos. Um, clearly, they, they cut pre-Holocene materials. You can think of these like a Pleistocene deposit or something, but they clearly, you know, based on the dating and this hypothetical trench, do not do that. And finally, we have these age undetermined fault, undetermined faults. These are faults that, um, you know, the stratigraphic or age constraints don't provide any evidence or recency of activity. Um, you can see that it could be through grading. It could be these bedrock faults where you can't determine the recency of movement on them or faults where you're missing some sort of Holocene section. Um, 
And typically, a lot of jurisdictions will regard these as being potentially active um, and require setbacks from them at the, at the local lead agency level. So I'll talk a little bit, Mike will talk more about this, about how we establish earthquake fault zones at CGS. Um, the two terms that come, come up a lot are sufficiently active and well-defined to be um, used as one of our, our faults that get zoned. Sufficiently active means that it has Holocene movement and well-defined means that through geologic studies, you can determine the location of the fault. Typically when we do this, this includes a compilation of geologic mapping and a literature review. And on this image, you can see like various interpretations of the Raymond Fault in this area of Los Angeles. Um, and all this has to be synthesized into, into what we use to, as a basis for zoning. We also conduct original geomorphic mapping, either using aerial LIDAR, aerial imagery, LIDAR, and field reconnaissance, and we will make these geomorphic strip maps uh, with different tecto active tec evidence of act active tectonics, such as linear drainages, vegetation liniments, breaks and slopes along scarps. All these are mapped on the imagery. And then we'll also compile whatever available site-specific investigations and other subsurface data that we can get our hands on. Um, each one of these, these polygons is a site-specific investigation done as a requirement by the city of Los Angeles in this area. Um, we also have some geophysical studies that were done, I think, by these triangles, and then there might be also water wells and other things. And so this is synthesized into basically a, a fault trace shown here is this line work, um, which is our best estimate of where the primary fault trace is, and then we'll buffer that with our earthquake fault zone around that fault trace. Oops, so I'm getting ahead of myself here. Um, all this eventually gets published in our earthquake zones or re required investigation maps. Um, these will also include local faction zones and landslide zones, local faction zones are in green, landslides are in blue, and then finally the AP zones, which are very narrow typically, are shown here in yellow. And then here's, here's a blow up of this area just showing more detail of, of the faults within the zones and then the zone itself shown here in yellow. And what these maps really mean is that any proposed developments within these areas that are zones, they, they must conduct some sort of fault investigation prior to development and then if the hazards identified at this site specific level needs to be mitigated, um, typically through using setbacks away, away from the um, active strands. Um, this is sort of the map view of that, that development in San Diego that I showed earlier, just showing um, sort of how this study at a site specific level is conducted by the consulting geologist. Um, you know, the, the, the project developer will hire a licensed geologist to conduct the geologic studies. They'll, everything sort of on the left-hand part of this image was in the AP zone. Um, they did a bunch of trenches across this project site. They identified strands of the fault zone that were deemed not active. Um, shown here is these thin red lines, dashed red lines. Um, but they did identify an active trace here, cutting diagonally through this project site. So that's the goal of the investigation is to locate the faults and determine fault activity at the site specific level. And then once when those Holocene faults are located, the consulting geologist will um, establish these fault setbacks away from that active fault and the design of the project can be modified to, to um, to incorporate that into there. And then eventually the local permitting authority, in this case, the city of San Diego, will review that project and eventually um, permit the project for construction. And then finally, the CGS is not typically in involved with the review of these site-specific investigations unless we're invited by the permitting authority or sometimes we'll be invited by the uh, consulting geologist to look at these trenches. And we'll, we'll take that data and actually incorporate it 
eventually into updates for our maps. Um, and then we also archive any um, site investigation reports that are submitted to the city to be used as a resource for other consulting geologists in the area. Um, if you want to know more about the AP Act, um, back in 2018, we, we did a revision to our special publication 42 um, with input from a technical advisory panel. And this included folks like, like Tom Rockwell, uh, David Schwartz from the USGS, Scott Lindvall from Lettuce Consultants International, um, Alan Hull, Ted Sear. And the intent was just to provide guidance to the community, you know, stakeholders regarding the requirements of the AP Act. Um, and then it's targeted, different chapters are targeted to specific audiences. So if you're a consulting geologist, you might go to a certain chapter that deals with dating and fault, fault offsets. Or, you know, if you're a city, you can go to a different chapter and find out what cities and need agencies are required to do in the AP Act. And then, as I mentioned just previously, it provides guidance regarding state of the practice for fault investigations. And so um, this is available on our website. Just the easiest thing to do is just Google CGS Special Publication 42, and you should be able to access it through a download on our website. Um, with that, I'll just let the talk dovetail into uh, Mike's talk, and we'll talk more about the, the Rose Canyon Fault Zone and the zoning that's been proposed for San Diego. Okay, thank you, Tim. So now is uh, the turn for Michael. <clears throat> okay, can you guys see my screen? Uh, yes. <clears throat> Okay, good. Okay, well, thanks, Jorge, and hello, everybody, and thanks for joining us. I'm going to try to summarize the recently released uh, fault report for the Rose Canyon Fault and highlight some of the methods and key studies uh, we did for this evaluation. So, the project were to reevaluate uh, the Rose Canyon Fault Zone in the La Jolla and Point Loma quadrangles, uh, shown here under Zone, for zoning under the Alquis Priolo Earthquake Fault Zoning Act. And to summarize recent studies conducted on the fault zone, specifically where new data indicates Holocene activity um, outside of existing fault zones. Um, and with the, with the main goal of extending existing AP zones and recommend, and recommend new zones. So the existing AP, um, AP zones are shown here in yellow. Uh, up here um, from uh, La Jolla to Mission Bay, and then down here in, in the San Diego Bay area and downtown. Um, so one of the other main goals would be to close this, this gap that exists between the existing zones, because we know the fault zone is there, and um, there's, there's recent studies that show activity within these areas that previously hadn't been identified. And also to um, um, the, uh, explain sort of the recent geomorphic interpretation um, of some of these areas. Okay, so um, we've split the, the zone into three sections, the Rose Canyon uh, section, Old Town section, and San Diego Bay section. Illustrated here, um, the Rose Canyon section extends from La Jolla to Mission Bay and then the Old Town section from Mission Bay to about just south of Old Town and the San Diego International Airport. And then the San Diego Bay section covers mostly uh, Middletowns, the SD, San Diego Airport and the downtown area. Uh, notable studies that we, um, for this project that we received were the Old Town Presidio Hills Golf Course that uh, Tom sort of summarized already. Um, the San Diego Association of Governments, or SANDAG, um, did a pretty extensive study for the Midcoast Quarter Transit Project, or trolley line, which extends from downtown all the way along the five, five freeway, Interstate 5 Freeway Corridor, along Mission Bay, uh, through Rose Canyon, and then continues north. So that was one of the extensive studies that we relied on for um, recommending new AP zones on these quadrangles. And then Kleinfelder 
Uh, that was that was done by Kleinfelder, and Kleinfelder also did extensive studies for, at the San Diego airport um, for new construction um, that was proposed there, which we'll summarize a little bit. And then finally, uh, Nino and Moore uh, recently did a study in 2018, um, sort of at Seaport Village, which is down here in the southwest corner of the downtown area. Okay, so some of the data sources and methods of data collection that we used for the project um, were paleo seismic studies, which are geared toward um, characterizing past events on a fault. And like many of the studies described from Tom earlier, uh, these are typically based on fault trenching and radiocarbon dating of soils. Uh, the Old Town Presidio Hills Golf Course was a study by Singleton and Rockwell and others. That's a good example of that, as well as the study that uh, Tom described at Rose Creek. Uh, we also relied pretty heavily on site-specific investigations, most of which were triggered by the San Diego Seismic Safety Study. Um, part of which is shown here in pink, the pink polygon represents the downtown special fault zone which, um, so any new construction in this, within this area requires a site-specific fault investigation. Um, and also the, the, the seismic, uh, San Diego Seismic Safety Study also includes um, quaternary, previously mapped quaternary faults um, within, within San Diego. And so generally, if you're near um, a previously mapped fault within the San Diego area um, that would also trigger a site-specific and uh, fault investigation for new construction. Um, so we also, oh, another huge source of, of data for this study is, is illustrated on the right, and that was Esri Geo Database, um, com compiled as a San Diego State Master's thesis by Luke Weidman. Um, and you can see how much data was within, within the, the database. This is sort of a compilation of, of fault investigations done um, and collect compiled by for the, for the master's thesis, as well as um, research at the city of San Diego records and geology sections, which are mainly in blue. And then the orange and green ones were mostly compiled by uh, Luke Weidman for his master's thesis. Um, there were many uh, as graded reports that we recovered as well that documented faults uh, in the downtown area that were not found during site investigations, but um, were sort of uncovered through additional research at the city. And then we also did coordination with government agencies like SANDAG and the Ju Judicial Council of California, um, which um, provided additional data uh, for the San Diego Courthouse and uh, on the San Diego fault. Um, so another method or, or data source was uh, geomorphic interpretation of fault related or fault generated features along the fault zone. Um, Kleinfelder performed a pretty detailed analysis for SANDAG and the trolley line project um, and provided interpretation of 1928 aerial photographs, which um, revealed a lot of features that had, weren't previously sort of recognized or are considered, but um, there, that, that mapping was also, you know, mainly done by Scott Rugg and Tom Rockwell and contributed a lot to um, this evaluation and recommendations for updating of the zone, as we'll see in a, in a few more slides. There was also analysis of historic topographic maps, which indicated um, all generated features like um, sags and, and pressure ridges and sort of um, really uh, relevant areas that contributed to the evaluation as well. Okay, so well, okay, I can't tell, it's, it's, it's forwarding, right? The slides, I can't, yeah. So, okay, so the three main strands um, in the Rose Canyon section, sort of a Rose Canyon section overview, are the Country Club Fault, uh, Mount Saladad Fault, and Rose Canyon Fault, which are illustrated here and run roughly sub, sub parallel from La Jolla um, down through Rose Canyon. Um, 
And these are responsible for uplift and formation of Mount Soledad and generally have sort of reverse um, strikes, reverse slip and strike slip um, movement. Um, the, the existing AP zone in yellow was established by Jerry Tryman and CGS in 1991 and was supported by fault related geomorphic features and interpretation of various uh, drainages, scarps, side hill benches, tonal liniments, slope breaks, and um, a linear drainage along the fault. Um, and there were also studies performed in La Jolla um, and Rose Creek, as, as Tom summarized, and also offshore, there was uh, some deformed, truncated, and, and faulted Holocene sediments identified offshore in La Jolla Submarine Canyon, which all led to um, recommending this existing AP zone. Okay, so I sort of covered that. So the, the recent site-specific data for this study um, was to evaluate the, the Rose Canyon section of the fault. Uh, the Sandag trolley line study by Kleinfelder um, performed an investigation here at the trolley line bridge crossing, which we'll take a little bit closer look at. And then there were two site-specific studies down here at Claremont Drive, which also identified the fault zone. And then south of the existing AP zone in this area, we'll see from, the, from some of the geomorphic interpretation, um, there's a distributed area of faulting and the fault zone appears to step uh, to the west or a right step in the fault zone. Okay, so as we previously saw here at the uh, trolley bridge line crossing site, this was a study for the Sandag trolley line and the methods of investigation at this site included just about everything. They did boring CPTs, geophysical surveys, and also logging of cut slopes, existing cut slopes. And um, Kleinfelder identified faults and structural discontinuities, displaced alluvium, um, stratigraphic discontinuities, and geologic units um, and CPTs disc and CPTs north of the bridge crossing. So you can kind of see from the cross section, cross section AA going across Rose Creek here, um, there were two main faults that were identified. And you can see the structural discontinuity of, of the bedding and the bedrock of the shale um, underneath the younger alluvium and how it varies across the fault zone. And then also what appears to be um, sort of an offset um, reverse faulted younger alluvial contact um, was suggested as well, indicating recent Holocene activity. And um, this this zone, so these faults, this fault zone I, shown here as, as orange lines um, identified for this study coincide pretty closely, almost you know exactly with previous mapping of the Rose Canyon strand of the fault across the northeast side of Mount Soledad, and indicates or suggests that this strand of the fault is active as well. And so is being recommended for inclusion in an um, in, uh, in AP zone um, in, the, in this quadrangle. Okay, let's see how side come down. Okay, so in the old, for the old town section overview was, Pretty not a lot, not a lot of data previously prior to this study. It was um, mapped as two main strands: the Rose Canyon Fault and the Mission Bay Fault. Uh, the Rose Canyon Fault on the eastern side was sort of a boundary fault with um, soils or, or bedrock interpreted to be down drop to the west, sort of forming Mission Bay, and a, a fault zone continuing through this section. Um, with Mission Bay, the Mission Bay and, and further concealed Mission Bay fault representing the, the western um, side of the fault zone. Um, key site specific investigations for this study were primarily in the old, just right in the Old Town area and included the Presidio Hills Golf Course paleo seismic study that Tom uh, mentioned and described, um, along with uh, the Mormon Battalion Historic Site, which was in Old Town where um, 
radiocarbon dating confirmed Holocene age of soils were faulted and and then uh, offset penagetic A horizon. And another study, north, the only study north of the San Diego River was the Moreno pump station done by AECOM, where uh, CPTs and borings indicated faulting of Holocene age soils. So, whoops, sorry, north of the, so north of the San Diego River in this area along Mission Bay relied heavily on geomorphic interpretation of, of fault generated features for the trolley project by um, Kleinfelder. And, and we'll take a look at that um, next. So within the Old Town section, this sort of shows the, the 1928 um, aerial photo interpretation by, by Kleinfelder, um, mostly from Scott Rugg and, and Tom Rockwell, and shows um, a continuous scarp, which is obvious in the photos, um, running along sort of parallel to the you know, existing railroad line in blue. Um, and then the, that scarp was observed to offset landslide margins um, which are represented at this location by numbers 20 and 22. There were also deflected uh, drainages and channel walls and a closed depression at number 25, where is still apparently a low spot in the office depot parking lot and floods and floods when it rains. So that would be a closed depression here, uh, which is uh, roughly this location. And then um, there was also pressure ridges formed from compressional forces on um, strike slip faulting along the zone um, here at number 23, 24, and also up here at number 11. And those are illustrated in the 1928 photo. Um, so in, in this area, sort of in the transition between the Rose Canyon and Old, Ta um, Old Town section, there was not a lot of features, not a lot of studies um, to rely on. It's, it's, it's sort of a diffuse zone of distributed faulting. And there are a few subtle discontinuous features and, and depressed for, um, topography there. Um, and so this area is interpreted as a right step in the fault zone, so the existing fault zone coming down from uh, Rose Creek and south of Balboa Avenue and then stepping over a little bit um, to the west or to the right uh, and, and continuing across that step with a, a low area of just sort of diffuse distributed faulting. Okay, so in the southern portion of the Old Town section, south of Old Town, um, just south of Old Town, the, the fault zone is, is known to widen and bifurcate into in different strands. Uh, this was previously recognized and supported um, and is supported by uh, recent geomorphic interpretations and, and topographic maps and aerial photos um, shown here. These are, this is the, on the right, uh, U.S. Coast Survey 1851 map um, showing a pressure ridge at the location of previously identified faulting um, and black lines represent the quaternary faults previously mapped mostly by Kennedy and Jerry Tryman, um, where there was known faulting in a cut slope here at Congress Street and is supported by um, the historic topographic map from 1851, as well as uh, identified also on the 1904 USGS topo map. And this is from mostly causing local uplift and reverse faulted sedimentary rocks um, from, from a strike slip movement in the fault and the widening of the fault zone um, south of Old Town. So also in these, you know, in these images, you can see some of the geomorphic interpretation that Kleinfelder did for our trolley project um, in the Middletown area. Um, east of I-5, there's some benches um, and features, pretty strong features stepping up the escarpment here, um, indicating some recent or Holocene activity. And these, these features coincide with previous mapping of the fault zone along Washington Street uh, by Kennedy and others um, 
much earlier that the fault zone is exposed there. So there's the interpretation, geomorphic interpretation also um, suggests recent faulting along this section um, uh, of the Old Town section. Okay, so the San Diego Bay section overview um, extends extends from south of Old Town uh, through the down to the downtown area of Coronado and includes the San Diego International Airport along with the downtown area. Um, south of Old Town, the fault zone widens to a distributed zone of multiple subparallel faults uh, with right normal oblique displace, displacements and creates an extensional basin forming San Diego Bay. And the main faults and existing AP zones, AP zones within this section include the Spanish Bight, Coronado, uh, San Diego Fault, uh, and downtown Robin Faults, and um, AP zones were established for these the AP zones in yellow were established by Jerry Tryman and CGS in 1991 and 2002. And the fault zone, well, the fault zone was reevaluated in 2002, which and added um, some of the some of the fault zones that you see um, in yellow. So sources of data for this section mainly relied on the San Diego seismic safety study and uh, site specific investigations, along with um, the master's thesis done by Luke Weidman at San Diego State and the uh, Esri GIS geodatabase, um, along with research at San Diego Development Services, um, compiling reports and as graded reports and additional data and along with, we received and coordinated with the Judicial Council of California um, for additional data on for the San Diego Central Central Courthouse, which was is in this area north of the San Diego Fault. And key studies um, with Holocene faulting in this seg section include um, the airport, uh, Seaport Village. Uh, down here, Seaport Village World Class Waterfront Development by Nino and Moore, and the San, San Diego Court Health Study by URS. Okay, so this is um, a little look at the, the studies done for one of the projects at San Diego International Airport, the Northside Project. Um, the analysis included closely spaced CPTs and correlation borings due to thick artificial fill and shallow groundwater, which uh, the fill I think was you know about uh, six to 20 feet thick and the groundwater depth was about eight to 12 feet. So it makes trenching really difficult and not really a good option for site investigation, but CPTs and correlation borings allow for a pretty um, good analysis and also um, radiocarbon dating of shell and organic sediment and wood samples were retrieved from the borings to age date um, and, sort of, um, and confine the, the movement on the fault. So the results of the analysis at this location, this is uh, on the top is a, a portion of CPT profile 300, which was down here. It um, indicated a graben structure with a small extensional basin and a vertical separation of the units in the bay point deposits of about 25 feet. Um, there was also vertical separation, uh, separation of several feet at the base of the Holocene deposits, um, shown here with the bay deposits um, and the contact with the bay point formation where uh, numerous offsets were also indicated um, along that along that contact. Uh, radiocarbon dating of shell and wood samples yielded age ranges in bay deposits from 780 to 6,040 years before present, um, clearly indicating a Holocene activity. And an uneven surface at the bottom of the fill like, likely represents false carps on the bay floor, which you can see um, is indicated in the CPT data uh, along the fill and, and bay deposit contacts, which suggests that there may have been scarps or in recent events um, on the bay floor prior to the fill, the fill placement. So this, they, this was a previously unknown fault zone. Um, 
and it was termed the East Bay Fault Zone by Kleinfelder. So there's really no suggestion or indication of it prior to this study or these studies at the airport. Um, most recent faulting there is likely as young as 400 years based on some of the other studies and the radiocarbon dating of the material ob obtained from the borings. And so it's clearly Holocene active. And as we'll see, like with a, in a bigger picture, there is definitely continuity suggested between uh, the East Bay Fault Zone and a splay of the Spanish Bight Fault and, and the Old Town Fault. Okay, so another study in the downtown or in the um, San Diego Bay section, another key study was uh, at Seaport Village for the waterfront development by Nino and Moore uh, on the Coronado Fault. And the Coronado Fault previously um, was an existing AP zone was established by CGS and Jerry Tryman in 2002, based, um, largely based on offshore seismic profiles in San Diego Bay. Um, by Kennedy and Clark. And they observed uh, displaced sediments at or very near the bay floor. And Holocene displacement was also found later, uh, somewhat recently on Coronado, within the existing AP zone um, for a tunnel project by Kleinfelder. So the, the map, uh, the image here, the Google image shows uh, the offshore CHIRP geophysical survey done by uh, Nino and Moore. Um, the red and green lines indicate the uh, survey lines um, of, this, of the survey. And they interpreted a fault structure south of Seaport Village shown in the bottom seismic profile um, right here as, as the Coronado Fault. And it, it, tr it was on trend, it was on trend with the previously mapped and identified Coronado Fault and it correlates with additional um, data and study done on short seaport village, as well as at the old police headquarters. And so yeah, it, they also perform for the study um, onshore CPTs and drafted profiles, which indicated mul multiple offsets and abrupt stratigraphic discontinuities along with faulting of subunits within the Holocene Bay deposits and interpreted it as the onshore continuation of the Holocene active Coronado Fault. Okay, and as I mentioned, so the fault was also found um, previously by Lettuce and Associates at the um, Old Police Headquarters site and they uh, correlated really well. And then also, you know, these, this fault is sort of on, on trend with a fault identified farther north of the PCH fault, um, suggesting some continuity or continuation of a zone of faulting um, farther north into the downtown area. Okay, so one of the other studies that was um, sort of key to the downtown area was the San Diego courthouse. Um, the San Diego Fault um, AP zone was established in 2002 by Jerry Tryman and CGS based on uh, demonstrated Holocene activity by Kleinfelder. And recent, the recent site-specific investigation by URS um, for a proposed tunnel utilized um, you know, various methods as well of CPTs, correlation borings, and trenching, um, which is illustrated here. So at, at the courthouse site, um, north of the San Diego Fault, um, CPTs identified another fault structure that exhibited, you know, downward drag along the fault and was also found at the surface. This is Fault Trench 3, which was located, you know, along the CPT profile at the surface and also encountered a five foot wide zone of shears um, that may have been wider, but was sort of truncated by um, previous uh, development and, and fill, but it confirmed uh, the northward projection of the San Diego Fault. And some of the other things that um, they found were thickness differ differences in beds, uh, which indicate a horizontal movement uh, along with, um, you know, along with the vertical movement 
um, suggested by the CPTs and another study further north um, suggested that the fault may project um, as far north as Beach Street, but there wasn't anything um, suggesting it was continued um, north, north of there. Okay, so in summary, this is kind of the big, big picture summary view of um, the existing and proposed new zones. Um, there's clear activity, uh, clear evidence of Holocene activity along the entire length of the fault zone. Um, the right step in the fault zone is interpreted across this area adjacent to Mission Bay where there's anticipated just sort of a wide zone of, of distributed faulting without any um, real like specific or um, um, fault strands. Um, the fault narrows through, through Old Town um, to a narrow zone and then widens just south of Old Town. It sort of splays out into numerous um, faults and strands forming San Diego Bay. And continuity um, is definitely suggested between you know, the splay of the Spanish Bite and the East Bay uh, fault uh, through Old Town. Um, and the Coronado Fault is, uh, con is, continues offshore as well as onshore and suggests it may continue further north and into the downtown area as well as a northward extension of, of the San Diego Fault um, downtown. And that's all I have. Thank you very much, Mike. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you to the three speakers. So now is a time for questions and answers. So again, uh, please, uh, you will see the reaction icon at the bottom right hand side of the screen in the menu bar. Click on the reaction button, then click on the raise uh, hand button. And then I will call you to, um, to make you to ask your question. Okay, um, Ali Bastani, please. So, like any projects in Orange County happen or another? Could you hear me? Do you hear me? I couldn't hear. It's not clear the sound, Ali. Uh, do you hear me now? Now it's better. <laughs> oh, okay. Sorry. Uh, this is Ali Bastani from GMU Geotechnical. Uh, we work in Orange County and I was wondering if uh, there is any plans or any like upcoming uh, investigations in Orange County by any time. That you know. I'm not aware of any um, plans for zoning currently in Orange County. I think that the question that was asked. All right, thanks. Okay. Any other question? To not attendees, <clears throat> questions or comments? Well, uh, I have a, a question and actually I have received um, uh, I'm going to share my screen because I would like to show, um, okay, this one. I have received several comments. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, uh, several comments about this area here. Um, I noticed that there, there is some concern about the continuity here or why this is not continuous. You already mentioned something, but <clears throat> um, this is causing some concern in some people. So could you elaborate more 
about why there is not this continuity here, this way or the other way? Um, I'll, I'll handle it and maybe Mike can chime in because he's more familiar with the, the specific data um, in that area. And there's, what, what when we looked at that area, um, you know, there, there appears to be a step in the fault. You know, you can see from those two different fault trends that, that there's, a, there's a right step, which would be an extensional step, sort of a mini graben perhaps in that area. But the real challenge for us when we looked at that area is that whereas the fault was fairly well defined to the north and in the south where we, we have our proposed zones, um, we had a hard time finding anything concrete in that area. Um, it's pretty low topography. There were maybe some suggestions of some very subtle to tunnel liniments. So geomorphically, the fault wasn't as well expressed <coughs> to the point where we were comfortable with, with zoning it. And then there's very few site-specific studies that have been done in that area as well. Um, at least as far as I know, Mike, maybe you can elaborate on that a little bit more that actually pins down where the fault is. And so it is hopefully an area that maybe people will be motivated to do more geologic investigations in that gap because, you know, as a geologist who looks at a lot of surface ruptures, I like, I like surface ruptures that are more or less continuous. I mean, their faults do step sometimes and, but, um, they also die out. And so it, in my, my opinion, it just wasn't well-defined enough to meet our criteria for zoning. Um, but maybe Mike and Tom can chime in yeah. that are there. Yeah. I think it's in addition, right? There was very, you know, there's really no expression of, of the fall through there. And also there were no site-specific studies. And I think investigations might be, you know, not be very, um, you know, um, conclusive in there as to where where exactly the main, the fault active strands are. If you're to to do just you know your your typical investigations, it might be difficult to locate the fault in that area as well. And I'll just add that there may be strands that are underneath the old 101 and not the current interstate freeway, and so. Um, there may not be any geomorphic expression left because they may have been uh, destroyed before aerial photography. So there's, there's a lot of uncertainties that went into that area because we just couldn't identify uh, specific fault traces that we could condemn as being active. Yeah. All right. The uh, way that we could address it just to follow up in the future maybe is we've been working, CGS has been working with USGS Rufus Catchings in particular, um, he's been using geophysical methods to fault stone guided waves to help map out faults. Um, perhaps getting their help would be one way of at least understanding the, the subsurface structure and continuity of the faults. It doesn't really necessarily help with activity, um, but it might help with getting a better handle on the structure in that area of the step over. Jorge? All right. So, John Ford. Excuse me? John? Yeah, I was wondering, um, sorry to interrupt, gentlemen. Uh, just a quick question. I'm a research student at ASU who is working on mapping currently himself. Is there any definitive secondary faulting that you would be considered well-defined enough to map on these segments so far? Or is it primary, like, are you just focused on primary faulting? Um, I'll take that. What, what we zone, so we'll zone anything. We don't really look at primary versus secondary faulting. We'll zone anything that meets our criteria of it being sufficiently active and well-defined. So, you know, if sufficiently active being that it's moved within the last 11,000 or so years and then well-defined is that we can either see it on the ground or some some subsurface study has identified it so you know it's even even some of these faults especially downtown where it's low relief and there isn't much 
geomorphic expression, at least because it's been developed for so long. Um, some of those would be sort of in the fault hazard analysis world would be considered secondary faults, but because they meet this criteria of being Holocene active and we've been able to map them in the subsurface, they, they end up being zoned. Okay, <clears throat> so Tony Court. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. yes. <clears throat> um, related to the last topic in this graphic that uh, Jorge has up, um, this shows the trace that suggests, <laughs> suggested trace, actually I sketched it, on the right side connecting two parts of the fault. That uh, line is consistent with two things. I, I back up to say I'm a structural engineer, so this is not my expertise, but I was interested in this particular area and I was involved in the scenario. So anyway, at this location, specific location where the pale yellow is and the suggested red line, there is a, uh, a baseball field that has a marker for the Rose Canyon Fault going through it, extending up to the north. There's also the 2008 city geologic map, which picks up that fault and continues it through that zone. And I'm wondering whether either of those issues considered in your uh, evaluation and should they be considered? Yeah, I can take that. So, I mean, that there definitely are, you know, the fault has been mapped there, but I don't, there hasn't been anything to suggest it's been recently active um, okay. to, to recommend the zoning. It, it seems like that may have been, you know, a boundary zone that was formerly active, but most of the activity seems to have shifted to the West as far as a, a geomorphic um, features. Um, you know, present in that area, but I don't, I'm not aware of any other investigations that would um, on the fault there, but I'm, I'm aware of that, um, base, the baseball field and the fault being mapped through there um, previously. I don't know if Tom, do you have anything else on that or? Uh, not really. Uh, the fault that's identified at the baseball field isn't really got the right strike to be one of the main faults. So. I've always been a little bit uh, cautious about that particular exposure, uh, but clearly there's more work that could be done in this area. Um, and part of the whole pur purpose of a zone is to get people to investigate. And from that, we're, we'll see where this goes in terms of finding those other strands that we don't know about. And one other comment on that, that zone in particular is uh, <clears throat> scheduled for some higher density development to tie into a uh, trolley station stop. And I would think that with that uh, consideration, it would be, it would behoove us to, to require some investigation in that zone for anybody who's developing so that you can get better data on that fault. Any comment about that? Okay, so Alex uh, Sarmiento. Uh, Hello, unmuted now? Yes. Yeah, yeah. There we go. Hey, hi, thanks. I, I just had a couple of questions. Uh, uh, Dr. Rockwell briefly mentioned uh, or showed uh, on one of his slides the La Nacion Fault, which I think is uh, the Graben bounding structure over to the east. I uh, just wonder if there are any plans to look at that and um, maybe any good estimates of slip rate? So that's an interesting question, Alex. Uh, it turns out uh, Drake Singleton, we have a paper in review. Uh, it's been through review, it's been sent back to the editors, and uh, we're waiting to see if it gets accepted. Uh, Drake has a new interpretation, which I find is, is really interesting. And what basically San Diego has uh, two things going on. One is this uh, San Miguel Valacito zone coming up from Baja, California from the Southeast. And then of course the Descanso fault coming up the coast and stepping slip through San Diego Bay and they coalesce onto the Rose Canyon fall through um, you know, all the way up to through La Jolla and offshore. And in his model, uh, the La Nacion is actually part of a step over 
associated more with the Vallecitos um, San Miguel system rather than uh, associated with the development of San Diego Bay. And this is in part backed up by the GPS data, which we will be publishing soon. And the reason we haven't published it is because we really need to have this model published first to better explain um, what we now understand in terms of the GPS data. So the La Nacion, the problem with the La Nacion is um, there, there have been some studies that suggested Holocene faulting. Uh, most of it is in uh, Pleistocene deposits. So, and it's a distributed fault zone. So if you've had Holocene faulting and then you may have offset of the horizon that gets obliterated by bioturbation or grading or something like that, you may not see evidence for it. There are scarps at the surface. The long-term, if you look at the overall uh, dip-slip component to the La Nacion system, it's about 0.1 millimeter a year for the long-term rate, which is not very high. Um, we published a paper in 19, Anderson et al, that we suggested if this thing ruptures on its own, it might have a 10,000 year recurrence interval. We expect that it ruptures uh, with some um, Rose Canyon events, but it might actually predominantly be active when we have those relatively rare events come up from the Southeast along the Vallecitos. So uh, the Vallecitos fault is incipient. I showed you what the DEM looks like. There's obviously something coming up through there, but the, the total slip on that system is not high. And it looks like a very young fault. And so it's not a well-developed system. I don't know if that answered your question, but there just hasn't been enough evidence of uh, young activity on the La Nacion. Yeah, no, that was great. That was really helpful. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> Any other question or comment? Okay. So if there is not any question or comment, um, just for your information, uh, we are going to post a link of the recording of this meeting on our website in the next few days. I understand that there are several people that could not make it today and they were, they were asking for that. And also uh, remember that the CGS is expecting your feedback if you have any all the information about that is posted also in our website and also in the CGS website and the City of San Diego website. So if there is any feedback, uh, please submit that. Uh, please stay tuned, especially for our next event uh, this month with the CEOs. And next month, our third Kenji Shihara Colloquium Series. So thank you very much to the speakers, to our distinguished speakers, Professor Rockwell, Mike and Tim, and thank you all of you for your participation and attendance. Thank you, thank you very much. <clears throat>